Today is starting, I suppose. Thank you for agreeing for this discussion, by the way, for the recent discovery of the closest black hole. I would like to ask you about the discoveries that you and the team made and about the future investigations. Uh, well, yes, what what is uh, do you have any specific question? I mean, the future investigation is to make sure that it really is a black hole and um, uh, we will probably do that by means of interferometry. What we ultimately want to get is you probably have seen the animation uh, and it's a, se it's a sequence of images that looks like this animation. The two stars moving around but not around each other but with the third object. What promoted in just a second? What prompted your interest in astronomy? Oh, in astronomy in general. It is yeah. uh, that is very, very long. You see, uh, when I was maybe 10 years old, I was already very interested in, in astronomy and I started observing from the back. Yeah, it was one telescope. It's actually that that got me in, into physics and mathematics and then I studied physics. There was a time when I was not sure if I would end up in astronomy or particle physics or something else. But in the end, I, I always decided to continue the astronomy path. Could you briefly explain this discovery and its findings? Well, it was a long story indeed. Uh, because originally we thought it was a, a binary star, just two objects, not, yes. not three. And they would have been interesting because um, they were these two stars are, are similar in many senses, like they have a similar star mass, they are similarly old, they are consequently of similar temperature, etc. But in one aspect they are very different. Namely, they, one is rotating very, very fast. It is a so-called PE star, which means it is rotating so fast that it is almost flying apart. There is actually material flowing off the equator. And the other is rotating rather slowly. So the original uh, investigation was to, to figure out why uh, two stars that are so similar, that must have formed together, why they would be so different. And uh, uh, now this is not something we could answer in the end, because this, the, distant, the system is of a different structure. But instead we found that it is uh, a, of a different structure, namely with three objects, but only two of them visible. And that is uh, that means together with if you if you put the data we get into Kepler's laws and and Newton's laws about gravity and optical uh, rotation, you find that the, that the third object must be very massive. And if you don't see it, but it is very massive, that means it cannot be a star. And that is how you concluded it was a black hole. What is that? How you concluded it was a black hole? Yes, the how we concluded it's a black hole is we derive a mass from these uh, Newton's and Kepler's laws. And uh, then we see if, given the quality of data we have, if it would be possible to, uh, to detect a star with such a mass. And then we, we went through several options down to the faintest possible stars we could imagine with such a mass, and there's no such object. Uh, we, our data is good enough that we must, would have seen such a thing. And therefore, if it is not luminous, it must be a black hole. What drew the team's attention to this stellar system, HR6819, in the Telescopium constellation? Well, in the first place, because it, is, uh, it was in a catalog of these extremely rapidly rotating stars, the B stars. They are really so rapidly rotating that they are oblate. They are not round, not spherical anymore, but they are oblate. And they have a gas disk that is flowing off the equator because they rotate almost at critical resumption velocity. And uh, that is that is basically my research interest, what is forming this. Why did the team start observing HR6819 specifically? Uh, as I said, because it's a it's a B E star. We were doing 
There are about 100 to 200 VE stars, which are in, of that brightness. And maybe 100, 150 visible from the Southern Observatory of La Silla. And so over the many years, we have taken, well, not all, but a fair fraction of them. And we started off with relatively few spectra, with only 10 spectra. And with this, we, we slowly sought our way through which are interesting and which are not. And at some point, this uh, did strike us as interesting because we thought it was a binary. And when did the research team start observing? Uh, the first observations, these few spectra, were taken in 1999. And the second sector of spectra was taken in 2004. What was the most fascinating aspect of this finding? Well, for me, it's it's the realization that uh, black holes are very common. I mean, I knew the numbers that uh, you get about one black hole per thousand stars, but that, that this actually means there must be some black holes rather nearby. And uh, Originally, you would expect most of them single, so you would never find them because they're very small, very black, nothing to see there. But when they're in a multiple system, then you can see them through their gravitational influence on the other stars. And uh, so that that basically was, I think, the biggest finding in here, that, that it's a multiple system, still a multiple system. Many stars are in multiple systems. But when a black hole is formed, we are a supernova, we would actually uh, think that many, many of these systems get destroyed, disrupted by the explosions. This did not happen. What technologies were used for this discovery? Uh, spectroscopy. In other words, a spectroscopy is a technology by which you... you uh, you spread the light, you resolve the light into the individual wavelengths, and then you can see the signature of the chemical elements as they form in the in the star. And uh, these signatures, uh, you usually assume they have a they have a fixed wavelength. If you observe them at a slightly different wavelength, this is due to the Doppler effect. And uh, so we with this Doppler effect, we could see that the, one of the stars. Was, was moving, and not at a constant speed, but it was moving back and forth with a relatively high velocity, six, uh, an amplitude of 60 kilometers per second, and um, a long period of 40 days. And as I say, with, with the combination of Kepler's and, and Newton's law, that is called the mass function, you can use these numbers to get a, to get a mass of what it must orbit around. It's in principle the same technology you use for finding planets, which is called the radial velocity technique. How did you get involved in this study? Uh, from the very beginning, as I said, I was uh, I was uh, interested in BE star. Actually, most of the teams, uh, Dietrich Bader, myself, and in the beginning, Sean Steffel, we were originally uh, arranging this this observations of many BE stars, and it just turned out that this one was particularly interesting. Apart from European Southern Observatory, which other observatories were involved in this discovery? Uh, none. It's only European Southern Observatory, plus okay. the observatory at La Silla. Two different telescopes. Then. Okay. Which were the two telescopes? The 1.52 and uh, 2.2 meter. The point is we used always the same instrument, but it was used, it was moved at some point from the ESO 152 to the 2.2 meter of the Max Planck Society. Were all the observations made from the La Silla Observatory? Uh, from La Silla not. There are other observations available, but we have not used them yet in this study. There are observations available that were uh, that were made by amateur astronomers. There's a database of amateur spectroscopy. There are observations in the archives that were made from the uh, Paranal Observatory. So at some point, we are going to look at all those observations. But for the discovery papers, we only used the observations that were taken from us here. How many people were involved in this discovery? Uh, right now, the, the paper has, has, I think, five co-authors. 
And there's a sixth sixth person, Stanislas Steffel, who uh, some years ago died in a car accident. And uh, that, that, I mean, he will at some, the paper is dedicated to him. He is not on the co-author list because this particular paper was written completely new. And uh, if, if he never had an, uh, a chance to actually even read the draft, then someone should not be co-author. What were the roles of the people involved in the discovery? Um, Marianne Haider and Dietrich Bader were the ones that uh, originally triggered the idea. I, I had the idea. I, well, it's, it's a long study because originally we studied it for a different purpose. In this different purpose, there was me, Dietrich Bader and Peter Hartrager. And we wanted to study it as a binary. Uh, Robert Clement is a, was a student of Peter Hadrava and he then also later now assisted in the study of the binary parameters. And Mariana Haida is an expert on X-ray binaries, which have a lot of black holes. So she was the she was originally uh, putting us on the track by proposing by presenting another paper on a black hole. What was the timeline of this study? Well, it took 20 years, as I said. We started observing 1999. It's, I, this, is, this is a typical scientific discovery. You find something you're not looking for. Which activity took the most time and attention? Well, uh, what, what took the most time was, was basically to realize that there is something that unusual in it. As I said, we originally thought it was something different and then uh, then analyzed it, found it was not what we had expected and so on. And that, that is all that drags it out. And then, of course, there was that Stan Steffel, who was a, a major driver in the study. He died in 2014, which basically uh, stalled the study after that until now. It was now that we picked it up because there was another paper appearing on a similar object, which uh, looking at that paper, I realized that uh, HR 6819 must be of the same type. What was the most difficult part of this investigation? Uh, as it basically is for any investigation to, I mean, you, you very early on have an idea what it might be. And it is always, the most difficult part is always to make it sure in such a way that, that also the colleagues would believe it. You have to explore any other options, any possibilities and exclude them one by one. What was your first reaction when confirming the unseen member of the triplet was a black hole? Uh, well, it depends. I mean, the first suggestions that it was a black hole uh, surfaced in 2010. But then we were very cautious because uh, that we, we, we were not quite sure. At that point, we hadn't really excluded everything else. And uh, so this was very, a very cautious time. And then standard. But when I, when I looked at it back in 2019, I managed to to convince myself relatively quickly now with whatever I had learned in the past six years. How old is this system? Um, judging from the two other stars that still exist in there, these two other stars must be between 15 and 70 million years old, probably closer to the higher value, probably closer to 70 million. So it's that is probably the age of the system. How rare is the occurrence of stellar systems with black holes? Well, when we're talking about black holes of a stellar mass, not supermassive black holes like they are in the hearts of the galaxies, only 50 of them are known. And uh, most of them are in binaries, just because, as I say, a single black hole is almost impossible to find. It is, however, uh, one of the first we are certain of, or at least the first we are, the one we are most certain of the first, that this is in, not with only a binary, we have one companion, but in a triple with two companions. 
How different are the stellar systems with black holes as compared to the ones without it? Well, black hole is is a uh, is the end phase of the stellar evolution. So every triple system that has a star with higher than twelve solar masses at some point must have a supernova explosion that results in either a neutron star or a black hole. The question is only is not that the, these these progenitor systems they are very abundant they exist everywhere. The question is how frequent they survive the explosion. That is something completely unknown. But I suspect there are quite many of them. This black hole does not have an accretion disk. What does this tell us about the system? Not very much. The other stars are, it will eventually acquire an accretion disk. The two other stars are not yet very evolved. They are still small and compact. As soon as they start evolving, in particular the inner one, it will grow. And when it has grown enough, then the black hole will start to accrete from it. But that is uh, a couple of million years to go still, at least. Tell us about the orbits of the two stars in HR 6819. Well, the, the, the inner orbit is, is relatively fast. It's, the, it's 40 days. That's a, a, not an unusual orbital period for two stars, but uh, the amplitude is very high. It, uh, it, it, the speed with which they orbit each other is high. It's 40, uh, 60, no, 60 kilometers per second. And together with the 40 days, that makes uh, a minimum mass of the other object. The outer orbit, we don't know. It is very far away. It could, it's probably, judging from the similarity to other systems, which has determined orbit, it's probably several decades. It could even be longer. How close do these stars get from each other? Um, since the orbit is circular, they will always stay at the same distance, at least the inner two, the, the black hole and the other star. For now, they will always stay at the same systems. They will not get closer or farther from each other. They are about as far as closer than the sun and the earth. The precise value is not known because it depends on the inclination angle of the system. Whether we see the system edge on or whether we see it face on, then, then there's a term sinus of the inclination with, uh, with which this goes. Is the black hole assigned an official name? For naming, naming is job of the International Astronomical Union. So. And traditionally, you would call it component A, component B, component AA, something like this. But even that, I'm not entirely sure how that would go. Because whether you do this by mass or which you, you sometimes you call the A, which is the mass, most massive. Sometimes you call A, which is the brightest. So does the team refer to the black hole by an unofficial name? No, not really. What are some of the properties of this black hole? Uh, black holes don't really have properties. It's mass. That's it. That uh, it has it has at least a mass of four point three solar, which means it has a size of a diameter of maybe about thirty kilometers. But that's that's about it. There's there's not many more properties a black hole can have. What do we know about the history of this black hole? Only that it comes from a supernova and that uh, triple system still survives. That is, that is basically telling us something about the, the explosion uh, must have been symmetric in a sense, because if it had been asymmetric, it, uh, the system would have been disrupted. What are the effects of the black hole on the star closer to it? None. It's, it's, it's pulling the gravity, but that is another star would just pull the same. So it has no radiation, it does not accrete, it's really, it's only, it's only forcing it into an orbit, nothing else. What were the challenges the team faced to discover this black hole? 
Well, uh, as I said before, it's basically to make sure that you have excluded all other options. It's really, it's uh, science is, is really about excluding the alternatives and so that finally only one possibility remains. How are the black holes with accretion disk different from those which don't have one? Uh, they, if they have something to accrete, then something falls into the black hole. And in that process, uh, they produce all sorts of emission. They produce X-ray emission, radio emission, and ours doesn't do that. It really is just black. As you mentioned, X-ray emission helps detecting the black holes with accretion disk. What are some of the other ways we can detect black holes without accretion disks? Uh, I don't think there's there's many other ways. You wouldn't detect them unless they have another object which you can detect. And then you have to infer it from the gravitational effects like this orbit. Do these stars orbiting the black hole have any known planets? Uh, no, and considering their type, it is rather un unlikely. Uh, these stars of the temperatures as far as I know, don't really have planets. They are too too violent in their formation process, too massive. Planets are normally around uh, older or, or less less massive stars. The report mentioned the spectroscopic time series of HR 6819 was similar to LB1. Mm. Tell us more about the system LB1. It's basically the same. This was a this was a press release from the uh, Chinese National Academy of Sciences in November. And then back then they claimed it has seventy. It is it is only a binary. One is a normal star. The other is a black hole. It has an accretion disk. And from this they inferred it would have had to have a very high mass. But uh, from a technical point of view, this type of analysis is incorrect. Uh, it, was, it was, at least to me, looking at the system, it was fairly clear that uh, the, the effect they ascribed to the black hole, which they thought was an accretion disk, must be um, an outer object, a third star nearby of this PE type, which makes the emission line. So it is, uh, it is basically looking at the paper, realizing that they are not right in their result, but I know what it is, and then realizing I have something similar just in my drawer. In what ways are LB1 and HR6819 similar and dissimilar? Uh, they are similar in almost every aspect. The, the inner beast, uh, as, as far as we can tell at the moment, uh, the beast uh, that is close to the black hole is rotating even slower than in HR6819. Uh, it's probably, it could be that it has been a bit modified, that it already has either transferred mass to the black hole or the progenitor of the black hole has transferred mass to that star. And uh, for 6819, there's no such indication. But otherwise, they are, we believe they are essentially the same. In what ways would the solar system be different if the sun was in the inner star's orbit, orbiting this black hole? It would not exist. I don't think, as I said, planets simply would not form around such a massive binary. I mean, planet formation about binary in principle is possible, but uh, the, the inner star would have been uh, a star with at least 12, maybe 20 solar masses. And uh, these, these stars form very quickly, burn very quickly, die very quickly. Planets would simply not have had the time to form around such an object. I'm considering our solar system was there. Uh, right now? Well, if you if you just put a solar system there that exists, you probably uh, destroy Mercury. It wouldn't exist. It would be not in a stable orbit. Probably also Venus would not be in a stable orbit. In the region of Earth, the orbit could be stable. So maybe Earth could just so barely exist. 
uh, the seasons would be different. There would be a strong 40 day modulation, which makes uh, every every 20 days or every 40 days you get a lot of radiation. Every 40 days you get only much less radiation. So it, it would be very hostile to life. What were the different radiation emissions observed in this system? The what? What were the different radiation emissions observed in the system? There's only visible light so far. We know of no other. What are some of the other observed systems that have similar radiation emission? As I say, just this is uh, from the point of view of a star, this is just normal stars. And uh, the black hole does not contribute anything to the emission, to the radiation. What does the future of these stars look like? Uh, the what of these stars? How, what does the future of these stars look like? The outer star will, will just evolve very normally like any other star of its mass. Uh, the inner star will, uh, will become a supergiant as well. But when it enters the supergiant phase, it will be big enough to get in contact with the black hole. And then the black hole will start accreting. It's hard to say what happens then. It may get big enough for the black hole to actually uh, fall into the star. And then shortly after the star falls into the black hole. Or it might end with the, with the accretion. So you're saying there is a chance the black hole may create an accretion disk feeding on this inner star. It will certainly, but it will take another few million years. Were you expecting a black hole to be so close to the solar system? Ah, uh, yes. As I say, there must be very many black holes. I mean, there are there are certainly black holes which are closer. It's just not very likely to find them. They are very they are, they are not infrequent objects. They are actually very frequent objects. It's just they are just very hard to find. What future investigations is your team planning for? Uh, with interferometry, we want to image that. And maybe we want to look in the, in the catalogs if we can find a similar system. We are looking for candidates where we might reasonably expect that it might be similar and then we can have a, a look in detail. What lies ahead in this system to be discovered? What? What lies ahead in this system to be discovered? In this system? Yes. Well, basically what we still have to do with this system is to make the numbers certain. Right now what we have is limits. We have a lower limit for the mass, but what we can do is we get a precise limit for the mass, or a precise value for the mass. So we, we have only a rough distance. We can get a precise distance. We can measure uh, the chemical composition of the stars that still exists if they in any way have been altered or affected by the by the original primary, by the most massive star that went supernova. So it will it should tell us a lot uh, in principle about uh, progenitor systems, about how how such massive stars evolve. Are there any future plans to observe nearby binary stars for black holes? Uh, as I say, we are looking into the catalogs if we can find similar systems that would give us hints that might be promising candidates. But uh, even if they are frequent, they are not that frequent that you could observe every star and just look for black holes. That is not an efficient use of telescope time. Are there any other observations you have been working on? Uh, well, there's a lot of things I'm working on, so that is, but they are unrelated to this particular project. What is your role at the ESO? At ESO, I'm a science operations astronomer, which means I, I run the telescopes. I support other astronomers when they come here to conduct the observations or when, when they cannot come 
or do not want to come, which also happens, I, I do the observations for them. And I do this about 60% of my working time. I work for the observatory in this in this capacity and one third of my of my uh, working time. I do my own research. Well, those were all the questions I had for you. Is there something you would like to add? No, I think that was fine. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for agreeing for this interview. It had been a great pleasure discussing this with you. Thank you. Ciao. Thank you. Have a good night. Thanks. You too. Have a good day, probably. <laughs>